Now, I've always been an adventure seeker, but it wasn't until I went to Peru to run 150 miles through the Andes Mountains and the Peruvian Amazon that I realized why. You see, through that experience, it challenged what I knew, what I thought was important, and what I perceived as valuable. And there's this neat thing about adventure. It really stimulates the mind, enhances perspective, and furthers understanding. When you push beyond your comfort zone, experience something new, and immerse yourself in a different environment, the end result can be extraordinary. And for me, it was. You see, I came back from Peru getting the education that I set out to give. I came back and I asked myself a question that I ask you today. If happiness were the national currency, would you be rich? You see, it all started back in August of 2013. I was just perusing the internet and I stumbled upon the nonprofit organization Impossible to Possible. Its mission is to inspire and educate young people by using adventure. So what we do is we go on different expeditions and we try to inspire young kids to reach beyond their perceived limits, to achieve the impossible and make positive change in this world. And all the while, we provide an educational curriculum. So I was chosen as one of five people from around the world to participate in the Peru expedition. And on this expedition, we ran six marathons in six days through the Andes Mountains in the Peruvian Amazon, and we looked at ecosystems. So we ran through eight different ecosystems along the way, and we talked about the human impact on each one, and we talked about how we place value on them. Now, I was absolutely ecstatic when I found out that I got accepted on this expedition. I remember sitting in a coffee shop in South Haven, Michigan, checking my email one day, and all of a sudden I said, oh, whoa, I'm running 150 miles through the Andes Mountains. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I better start training. <laughs> I better get a passport, and I should probably ask my parents. You see, I thought the whole ask forgiveness thing rather than permission might work. Maybe avoid using that when dealing with international travel. <laughs> However, they are here today, <laughs> and um, they had a few long conversations with me, but we eventually found myself in Peru three months later. Um, anyway, so when I got to Peru, I met all my fellow ambassadors. There were two from Canada, one from Iowa, and then one from Australia. I found myself using an accent more than I thought I would on that trip. Um, and all the youth ambassadors were very excited. However, I think we were all secretly terrified. Heck, I had never traveled internationally. I had never run one marathon, let alone six. But here we were, in Peru. <laughs> uh, so after that, let me kind of tell you how it went. So each day we woke up about 6 a.m. And during this whole expedition, we were camping the whole time. We didn't shower. And our bathroom facilities consisted of anything Mother Nature had to offer. At one point, uh, one of my fellow ambassadors accidentally almost got bit by a poisonous snake as she was using these said facilities. But we picked it up and it was OK. <laughs> um, anyway, so each morning again, we woke up at 6 AM. We'd have uh, breakfast cooked by our Peruvian guides, complete with tropical fruit and lots of bread. They really liked their bread in Peru. Uh, and then we began running at 8 AM. So we ran from about 8 until 11 or 12, stopped for break, refueled, had some lunch, lots of cookies, lots of sugar. And we got our hydration packs on, and we kept running until about 5 or 6 in the evening. After that, we did our educational component. We filmed things, and then we provided it to a, a website. And on this website, classrooms from around the world subscribed to what we were doing. They followed, they asked questions, and they really engaged with us. It was amazing. And then after that, we had dinner, crawled back into our tents, and went to bed. But the first day, we were actually in a cloud forest. It was 10,000 feet in elevation. And being from the lovely flat state of Indiana, and training in the flat state of Michigan, I wasn't quite used to this high altitude. Nonetheless, I took a deep breath, took that first step of that first marathon. It was kind of an out-of-body experience. I didn't really know what to think about when I was running. Just kind of cruising along, looked to my left, I saw some clouds, looked to my right, saw some more clouds. All I knew was I was running straight. Um, but we continued this way until lunchtime, had a break, continued after lunch. And then, um, you know, all this while, we were running in the Andes Mountains. So as we kind of descended from the cloud forest, we got more and more on these edges of steep cliffs. We found ourselves running through waterfalls. We found ourselves you know, taking these steep climbs, just trying our best to continue. And on that first day, it was fun. I'm not going to lie to you, it was fun. Because we felt good, we were prepared. We were even singing each other's national anthems, you know, teaching each other the Spartan fight song. It was great. Um, but then day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, Marathon two, marathon three, all the way to marathon six. We really started to feel it. It was physically and mentally demanding. I felt like I was carrying my legs because I felt like they weighed 500 pounds. 
I felt like my knees were crumbling and my limbs didn't exist anymore. It hurt. It hurt really bad. And eventually, little by little, all the youth ambassadors started experiencing different pains. One girl had to get her blisters popped by a needle every night. Another one had tendonitis in her feet. Another one pulled their IT band. But somehow, we found it within us to continue. Although there were tears, there were frustrations, we found it within us to continue because we knew that we were there to inspire. We knew that we were there to help these kids understand that you can achieve anything with hard work. And when I first went to Peru, I understood that it would be challenging. I understood that there would be obstacles. But what I didn't expect was how much the environment and how much the local people would impact me. You see, I set out to inspire these young kids, but I came back feeling inspired. I felt like I was the one being inspired because I was inspired by Peru. You see, we had a really neat opportunity to run through different villages and communities. And during this, we had an opportunity to talk with the locals. And I speak Spanish, so I was able to really communicate, ask questions, and understand their way of life. And what I found is that they lived a lot simply than, or a lot more simple than we did. And that's okay. But the biggest change, and my biggest thought came on day three, when we ran through a, a small community. In this community, we entered it and I witnessed a lot of poverty, or we in a cultural context would consider poverty. There were people who didn't have adequate clothing. Some people didn't live in homes. Other people didn't have enough food. But you know, I started talking to these people and I was amazed at the pure joy they possessed. These people weren't complaining. They were just happy to be. They were happy to be living. They were happy to be in this environment in which they could breathe and experience. And soon we started playing with kids in this market. They were playing soccer. And these kids had sticks as their goalposts. They had this rugged soccer ball. They had dirt on their face and holes in their t-shirts. But they didn't care. They knew how to enjoy themselves. And they were having one heck of a time. So we were exhausted. We were in Marathon 3, but we found it within our legs to join the game. We went in and they laughed as we tried to kick the ball with our tired limbs. They giggled as they scored goals between goalposts. But they wanted for nothing. Absolutely nothing. And those are my thoughts as I continued that third marathon. I felt liberated. My body hurt, but I felt like I could conquer the world because I started reassessing my life. I asked myself, if happiness were the national currency, what would I do to become rich? And these are the thoughts I continue to qu ask question. Because as I started to think about it, I realized that in America, we have this perception that we have to save those who are in poverty. We have to save those who are well off. But what if actually, we're the ones who need saved. Because we focus so much on this clutter. We find ourselves consumed by this to-do list, by these promotions, by this job ladder. Sometimes we are so driven by that monetary value of success that we forget to enjoy the short term. We're consumed by this long-term goal that we forget to enjoy right here. And I've got to tell you, life is happening in the short term. It's happening right now. And those were the thoughts I had as I continued Marathon 3. Again. My body was screaming at me, but I felt good because I kept cruising along. And those, that thought process of what I would do to become rich in happiness kept penetrating through my mind as I kept moving my arms. But then day four came. And on day four, we went to a smaller community. And in this community, we knew that we were going to meet up with the school to give them school supplies. So we had all these big school supplies, these bags. We were ready to hand them out. But we thought, you know, it's a Saturday, we won't get a lot of students there, it'll just be a teacher and then one or two students. But before we knew it, there were people everywhere, crowding the streets, welcoming us to their community. We were ecstatic. We couldn't believe it. As little by little, people started coming up to us and staring at us in wonder. But I found myself just staring right back at them, didn't really know what to do. Uh, but again, we started talking to them in broken Spanish, asking them what their favorite sports were, what their favorite animals were. And then all these little kids started getting all excited and they were poking us, kind of wondering what we were all about. Soon we decided to play a game with them. So we played Simon Says, or Simone Dice. Simone Dice toque su nariz. Simone Dice salto arriba y abajo. The kids loved it, and so did we. Uh, then we decided to hand out the school supplies. So we took pencils, we took markers. I said, Lucia, para ti, Javier, para ti. And they kept laughing, they loved it, they were applauding. But then all of a sudden, there was this little girl, this little eight-year-old beautiful girl. She stood up among everybody, and she gave a speech, a speech in Spanish that she rehearsed. We had no idea this was coming, but this simple speech brought the youth ambassadors to tears, absolute tears, because this eight-year-old girl, she stood up there, 
She said, this is a pencil. But it's not about the pencil. It's about what you do with it that counts. She said, this pencil will run out, but the marks you make and how you use it will not. And so here I am, a college student, with hundreds of pencils. And this eight-year-old girl with one pencil helped me understand. She helped me understand that life isn't about how many pencils you use. It's about how you use each pencil. It's about the little tasks or the little strokes that you make along the way, the little marks that make your life worthwhile. And again, those were the thoughts that I had going on marathon number five and number six. Again, my body was screaming at me to stop, but I said no. My mind was going at a rampant pace. My heart was beating a million miles a minute because I realized that my direction was changing. I realized that the, what I thought about life was changing, and I finally understood after one eight-year-old girl helped me understand. She helped me understand that life is an occasion. And it's an occasion that can create this lasting impact on this world, but only if you find the true joy. So instead of working so hard to make sure you get to that final destination, that final point, enjoy the marks that you're making along the way. Enjoy the opportunity you have and open your eyes to the raw beauty, the raw opportunity that we have to make a lasting impact through joy and to find this happiness. And those were the thoughts that I had as I finished my expedition in Peru. Now, I was enthralled by all of it. Again, I thought ex I went to Peru just expecting this physical challenge, but I returned with a whole new thought process. And I think that's the neat thing about adventure. It stimulates the mind. You know, you go in expecting one thing, and you come back with a sort of new identity, a sort of new thought process. And that's what happened to me. You know, I'm a student at Michigan State studying journalism. But in doing so, I'm trying to read between the lines and find what my true happiness looks like. And so I stand before you today to challenge you to observe and understand how you're using your pencil and to make sure that in that use, you're finding your true happiness. And you're asking yourself, if happiness were a national currency, would you be rich? So with that, I say thank you to Impossible to Possible for the opportunity. Thank you, Peru, for the per perspective. And thank you to that eight-year-old girl with that said pencil. Lastly, thank you for listening.